Thank you very much, both of you. That was an excellent framing of the debate. And uh, for those of you who are also confused as to what I'm doing here, I would like to say that I, I am here because of uh, some people who I have become very close with over the last few months as I rode off into the sunset after being uh, the Speaker of the House and a state legislator. You know, my, my friends on the right were afraid that I would ride off into the sunset and then maybe primary them someday in some future election. My friends on the left were hoping I would ride off into the sunset and get hit by a bus. But um, <laughs> instead, I'm here, and I'm here uh, in thanks to, to Dr. Evans, to Dr. Wall, and Dr. Duchant, because uh, one of my new titles is I am the first senior policy fellow here at the Hammonds Institute at Lindenwood. And I want to thank them very much for including me in this exciting new venture. It is not even two years old, the Institute, the Hammond Institute here at Lindenwood, and we've already had some marquee events with some marquee national people. And I can tell you, I'll tease this for you, there's a lot more and uh, in incredible things coming down the line. So I want to thank them very much for having me here today. Now, if uh, before I get to the discussion, you know, these are, uh, we have a lot of uh, young people in the audience and a lot of young people at heart. And I can tell you that every single one of us who have been at this microphone understand the importance of social media. So if you want to keep up with us after this event, uh, Mr. Norquist, Mr. Nader, Jamie Allman, and I all have Twitter handles. I believe we're also on Facebook as well. I'm not going to run through those handles. I learned a trick the other day. If you Google someone's name and the word Twitter, you'll find out if they're on or not. So you can follow us and continue the discussion with us there. Let me start off by, uh, let me ask Grover a question first about, you know, if, if from a conservative point of view, uh, some, some Republicans may say, you know, on the federal level, and Grover and I have talked about this before, so much of the federal budget is taken up with uh, the social spending, with the welfare spending. Medicaid and Social Security are the lion's share of the budget. You throw in defense spending and there's really not much room for anything else. From personal experience on the state level, I can tell you it's very similar to that. You take out the, uh, the budget we have for social services here in the state of Missouri. Education is the next biggest bucket of money. There's not much money left for anything else. So if you're a conservative or a Republican, you say, we've had decades of the New Deal and, uh, and of, all the, uh, of the war on poverty and all these wonderful programs for people. Not that we shouldn't be helping people in need, but the government doesn't do it well. So what harm is it? for those of us who run businesses or support business or who like business owners, shouldn't they get a little piece of the pie? What's a few million here and a few million there, as we say in Jefferson City? In DC, it's a trillion or gazillion here and there. So Grover, what, what is the big evil behind crony capitalism? Sure, I, I think it's very similar to earmarks uh, in Washington, DC, where we actually got a ban on uh, most earmarks, where Congress would do an earmark for some local project, some company. Uh, and earmarks were only a few billion dollars, maybe tens of billions of dollars in, in a trillion do trillions of dollar budget. But if everyone in the store is shoplifting, nobody's paying attention to the embezzler, um, you, you've, you can't habituate elected officials to the idea that you can take a little bit here and give it to your friends and then ask them to have any fiscal discipline on the rest of the budget because, among other things, they know they're kind of guilty about it. So I think that, that earmarks and government grants to businesses, uh, cronyism, uh, are the broken windows of government overspending. It may not be the biggest budget item in the budget, and depending on how you describe or define some of the cronyism, it, it can get pretty large in terms of dollar amounts. Um, I think you go after the most vulnerable uh, spending programs, and that is the cronyism, that is the earmarks. It ha they have the fewest defenders when focused on. Uh, and I think it's been very helpful. I mean, there has been, we worry about how come there's no change in Washington, D.C. In the last f few years, since 2010, we have taken the um, the culture and turned it upside down. It used to be that people bragged about earmarks. It was a sign, if you were a congressman or senator, of your virility. You were bringing all this stuff, you know, an antelope back to the, to the village. You look at this, I am bringing, you will all eat now. Um, and you should like me because I brought a bunch of money and I gave it to somebody who lives near you. That's what an earmark is. 
um, and you're supposed to be excited about that. But it, it was. People put it in their obituaries as congressmen and senators, that they were very well known for bringing back pork, and that was considered a good thing. Today, it, it's up there with farting at the dinner table. You'd never talk about it. These people act like they never did it, um, and they certainly won't do it in the future. So we went from something being seen as virtuous to being understood to be semi-criminal. And so I, when people say, can you do dot, 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 some of the projects that, that Ralph and I have worked on, the answer is, if we did that with earmarks, it's got to be possible to make more success. Wonderful. Excellently stated.